I got traded to Pittsburgh, and they give me a stall, obviously. So I'm in a stall here. And beside me, the next stall, it says 66 Mario Lemieux, but it's empty. So the next stall beside me, it's empty. So the old March playoff, there's nobody beside me. Next year, we start again, September, October, November, nothing beside me. And early December, the trainer is like, Renee, make sure, can you put your stuff, don't put any stuff there. Mario's coming back in December. He's back. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, don't put your tape and your stuff on the stall because he's coming back. It's his place. Okay. So December 26th, I think, Christmas time, Mario comes back, and he's right beside me in the locker room. So I remember, so I'm going to tell you a story, and I'm French and English, but we're like this, and Mario is like always like, Renee, please, don't move the tape. So I give my tape, and he, he stock tape. He, he just, so I get up, I go to the table. There's a bunch of tape in the table, so I get more tape. So I come back, give me some tape, give some tape again. And he, about a week from now, he sit beside me. He's like, in French, he's like, hey, Rene, he's like, stop it. You can ask me for the tape back. It's okay. Don't have to get up to get your own tape. We're teammates. It's Mario Lemieux. I'm like, this is a legend. I'm like, I'm not going to ask him for the tape back. But he's like, ask me for the tape back, please. <laughs> Perfect. So, like, so That was Stanley Cup champion Rene Corbet. And you are listening to the Up My Hockey podcast with Jason Padone. Welcome to Up My Hockey with Jason Padolan, where we deconstruct the NHL journey, discuss what it takes to make it, and have a few laughs along the way. I'm your host, Jason Padolan, a 31st overall draft pick who played 41 NHL games, but thought he was destined for a thousand. Learn from my story and those of my guests. This is a hockey podcast about reaching your potential. Hello there and welcome back or welcome to the Up My Hockey podcast with Jason Padolan. We are all the way up to episode 58. And uh, for episode 58, we are visiting Rene Corbet. Rene Corbet was a second round draft pick. In today's standards, he would have been a first round draft pick. Uh, 24th overall in the 1991 entry draft to the Quebec Nordiques. We cover that draft in this conversation, and it's interesting because that's when the same draft that Eric Lindros went first overall, and uh, and Eric Lindros did not go up to the podium and put on the jersey. He was very public that he would never play for the Quebec Nordiques. Told them not to draft him. Uh, so Rene was the first pick that would up go up to the podium and, and put on the Nordique jersey uh, to much fanfare since it was in uh, held in Quebec. So Rene um, had an amazing. Absolutely amazing junior career. Uh, 79 goals his last season in 63 games, 148 points. Led the entire QMJHL in goals and points that year. And uh, went on to have a very successful pro career. We cover his his first year in Cornwall where he was Rookie of the Year in the AHL. uh, And then uh, relocated with the team, the the Nordiques, to Colorado where they won the Stanley Cup. And that was uh, Rene's first full season uh, in the NHL. And the irony uh, of this, which is which is funny, and I find the coincidences happen all, more often than not, but uh, Rene played the Memorial Cup final with the Drummondville uh, with the, with his uh, Drummondville team against the Spokane Chiefs and lost in the final. And I was actually at that game, not playing uh, because I was I was too young to play in the league at the time, and I was in the Spokane Chief dressing room. So. Uh, unbeknownst to me at the time that Rene was on the ice and I'd be a future teammate of his. But we also crossed paths without playing against each other in the uh, Stanley Cup final where Colorado beat Florida uh, in four games, uh, in a four-game sweep, uh, where I was a black ace again. It was my first year pro, and so I watched uh, Rene uh, raise the Stanley Cup, again, not knowing who he was or that we would be future teammates. But it's kind of funny the way the hockey world works. Uh, Rene got to play with two players, um, that I immensely respect, one being Joe Sackick and the second being Mario Lemieux, who was my idol. So we get to talk about his time there with Colorado, uh, being stallmates with uh, Mario Lemieux and uh, and all the amazing players he got to play with and, and his time in Germany. So th- this is a great interview. Rene played with a ton of passion. He played with a ton of fire, really enjoyed the game. 
loved being at the rink. That, that was one thing I remember about Renee. He always enjoyed being there. He loved playing the games. He was a competitor, and, uh, and I'll always respect him for that. So uh, without further ado, I bring you my friend and teammate, uh, Mr. Rene Corbet. All right, here we are, back for episode 58 with an old French teammate of mine. He's already been giving me the gears. I don't have enough French players on this show, but um, I am more than happy to welcome Rene Corbet to the Up My Hockey podcast. Thanks for coming on, Corbs. Hey, you're welcome. No problem. It's awesome. I'm excited. Sweet. Sweet. Yeah, it's so cool. And uh, as the as strange as the world is, right, You, uh, I reach out and you happen to be just down the road from me playing some golf. And uh, now we got a tea time set up for August, and uh, that's what I love about this podcast is reconnecting with guys. So super cool, um, yeah, man. Like p- part of this, and I, I know that you've kind of just been looking looking into the podcast list in a while. You, you'd said off air there that you knew you knew about it, but hadn't really looked into it and saw some of the guests and everything else. And really, the the whole idea here, Corbs, is one: you and I can have a good time here, just uh, you know telling some old war stories and seeing what's going on, but also like to talk about your story and your journey and how, you know, yep. how you ended up in the NHL, how you ended up in Germany, you know, maybe any adversity along the way, things you had to go through because um, I know as a young athlete, and maybe you can relate to that. Uh, like these types of uh, these types of services, like a podcast, like we never knew these stories, right? Like we kind of were doing it on our own. We didn't really know, how other guys were doing it. And I just think the stories are so valuable for the young players today who want who want to raise that Stanley Cup like you did and who want to wear an NHL jersey. And I think everyone's everyone's story is is beneficial. So that's sort of the, you know, that's the genesis of this and where it's coming from. So uh, just to kind of give you a heads up on the questions up there. Yeah, no, I, I, 100%. You know, I, I understand that. And I'm happy and I'm proud to see guys like you doing this thing because it's important on this world these days like young guys young players and i have three boys in hockey you have three boys as well mine are older and it's important like you have good mentor and people like you and i can tell uh these kids and all the hockey guys can tell the kids and family how we did it our stories and what's important and it's just a suggestion to them to take it or not but at the end of the day we've been through this and it works so and I, I, it's, I'm very happy you're doing this. It's oh, awesome. awesome. Thanks, Corpse. Uh, yeah, we'll definitely get into the father's side. And I mean, to be 100% honest, you know, uh, when I when I got out of the game, I got out of the game um, and kind of closed the door and walked away. And I was I was kind of good. You know, I was into business in the corporate world. And then I have have these three boys and get married. And all of a sudden, they start loving hockey and they're getting back into it, which brought me back into it, which I'm super grateful for because – um, seeing it now through the lens of, you know, coach, mentor, um, you know, leader kind of in that capacity, it's such a different experience as being a player. And, and I actually uh, have found more gratitude in my own career, more, you know, more uh, ability to reflect kind of, you know, see where a guy maybe went wrong, see where, where he went right. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, I love, I love sharing the stories um, and sharing other people's stories. So let's start with you, man. Like, you know, looking back, you know, I, I love going through the hockey DB. As I said off air, we didn't have this when when we were playing yeah. with each other. And, uh, you know, I like starting back in minor hockey for the most part. Like, because everyone, it's funny. I mean, I've had quite a few guys on here. Jared Smithson um, comes to mind. Like, guys who weren't maybe hockey stars as, as youth athletes, you know, who ended up having long NHL careers. And and um, and I, I would assume that you, you were kind of the prolific scorer back in youth hockey and that you were probably playing up a level. But, I mean, who knows? How, how, how was that for you uh, growing up in, in Victoriaville? Was that where you were growing up? Yes, uh, around the Sensia Saint in Victoriaville and Drummondville. And that's how I play on my hockey, my, my hockey. And if I look back, since, since Timbits, since Novice, what now they're calling you – six or you four, whatever they call it these days, but that's fine. And it was always like, uh, I was always the top of the top, always growing up. And, and when you came closer to, uh, to be a man and play with men hockey, uh, you realize you're not that good anymore and you have to, uh, adjust or, uh, you have to realize that, you know what, it, you have to push yourself and the only person who can do it is you. You can have all the the potential, the resources, everything around you to help you, and that's this is amazing. People can help you and tell you and help you on putting in the right direction. 
at the end of the day, it's you decide to make the move and make the adjustment to make it. And uh, I was fortunate, you know, I have a lot of good people around me uh, growing up. Uh, I scored tons of goals, lots of assists growing up in a minor hockey. But when I was turned 20, 21 years old, 22 years old, all of a sudden it's like, you know what? There's a lot of guys like you. Because, right. you know, and, and you have to realize that, you know what, what are going to do to make you differently special uh, beside the guys beside you? And, you know what, uh, it's it's commitment. It's uh, the way you take things away and be committed to do it and, you know, be serious about it and achieve your goal. Right. Yeah, well, for sure. I mean, at every level, every level it happens for some guys at different times, right? But every time you step up, um, the funnel tightens, as they say, right? You know, like you're yes. getting you're getting to the best of the best. Um, but back in minor hockey, I saw that you did play in the Quebec Pee Wee tournament. Um, was that, uh, what was that experience like for you? I've had a couple of other people on here before. Were you guys yeah. in the top division? Were you successful there? Were, you know, how, how did that go for you? You know what? Pee Wee tournament, Quebec is the best of the best ever. I, uh, I experienced my entire life as a young guy, young boy. And I try, we, well, we try the last couple of years or three years ago to get one of my boys to participate in a tournament, but it's really hard because in Calgary, they brought one team only and we didn't make it. We're so close to do it and we couldn't make it. Uh, but it is a big tournament and this is the best experience ever. And, you know, and it takes a lot of, uh, a lot of work, a lot of commitment from parents, volunteer, raising money to get to that tournament because it's, it's not cheap. You got to get there for 14 days, almost two weeks, three weeks to Quebec. If you're from Calgary or from BC to get there and, uh, but you know what? It's worth it. You know, as a young kid, if I remember for me, I am very glad and fortunate that my parents made that happen for me or the teams I was playing for. I made that. And as best experience I ever have. That's After cool. see the uh, uh, Bonhomme de Neige Carnival, you know, it was a carnival in Quebec. It was awesome. Did you, uh, so you built it out, right? Like that's one of the par parts of the thing there, right? Don't you stay, you stay with a family and, uh, yep. and, and were your team successful? Were you successful in that tournament? Yeah, we, I, I don't. It, it, if I remember, I think we're we we're, we're okay. We didn't. We're, we're not the last, but we're pretty good. You know, it, yeah. it was uh, it's one of those things that uh, in Quebec, I think there was a few teams from Quebec, so we're not the best team because we couldn't gather all the best players together. So there was a few teams like you know, Alberta. They have the best team. In Alberta coming. BC best team. United States uh, from Russia, Czechoslovakia. So they have a lot of teams coming in for those places. But in Quebec, uh, in where there's a lot of teams playing. So, but we were good. We're, we're represented very well. Uh, we're a good team. But at the end of the day, it's just the experience living the ballots, right. uh, playing many sticks in the hallways at the rink. Like all that stuff was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's super fun. And then also the crowds, right? If you were playing in the right rink, you'd, you, you, you'd have a lot of people in front of you. And when you're 11, 12 years old, that's pretty, that's pretty wild experience too. Totally. Um, when you, you, so you're saying your best of the best kind of going up there as a minor hockey league player. Was that, and now, like I said, now you're a parent and you, you've you had, you know, your, your son's playing junior. You have some other ones. Uh, your youngest is an 09 like mine, uh, who's peewee age again there. Do you, did you play up a, a league at the time? And what is your, what is your whole feeling or philosophy on that? Should you, should you, should you enjoy being that, that best player and the ability to score goals and beat guys one-on-one -on -one, or should you be playing up and, and maybe be challenged a little more, but not score as much? Do you have an opinion on that? Uh, yes, and and I think all kids are different, and I think uh, for for my my person, my boys, or I think any kids' advice I would give these days, I think it's always good to push yourself. Like when I was young, I pushed myself, play with my sister, uh, friends, and outdoor rink. They were like 17, 18. I was 13, 12, and I played with those guys, and they want me to play with them because I was good. Yeah. So I would put myself to play with all the boys. I think it's always good to push yourself at, at one point. But at the end of the day, there's no rush. You have to realize that your path's going to happen. There's no rush. Don't push the kids to become what they're going to be. They'll become what they're going to be. At the end of the day, uh, I, and I got three boys right now, and I'm not pushing them. Uh, I love the way they process and stuff. But I like to make sure if they have a chance to play in a higher level, I would say yes. You might not have a much ice time, but you're going to be coaching with good coaches. You develop better practicing and everything. And when you return to play, you're going to perform and your chance will come. But I would like to, to say 
uh, yes, I like to move my boys to a higher level if I can. Right. Yeah, it's a uh, it's sort of a catch twenty two, and I think it's right that you're saying that each one is each everybody's different, right? Because sometimes. Yeah. Uh, confidence is a pretty shaky thing, as you know, um, playing this game, you know, and uh, and when we can get in a situation, depends on the personality type, that maybe being a third liner or not being able to score some goals can really draw a kid back, even though he is being pushed and he's around better players, right? So I think it is understanding the personality of of your athlete, you know, where where they're gonna where they're gonna strive, and and again, right? I mean, it's it's fun scoring goals. I don't know. I, I think. I think that's, I mean, that's why kids are playing, right? Or some kids, some kids really enjoy, enjoy that. So, I mean, 100%. why, yeah, I mean, we have to remember what they're there for too. And not everyone's going to, going to, uh, you know, uh, chase, ch get to the NHL and, and do that whole thing. So it's uh, it's an interesting, it's, it's a big rush. Like you said that already, right? It's, it's, it seems like it's a big rush for everyone, like to, to get there, to get there now. And it's like, my God, they're 11, they're 10, you know, they're 12, right? Like, um, I don't know. Sometimes we got to put on the brakes a little bit, I think, and just enjoy the ride a little more. 100% I think family and have to be they have to understand that this is this is a journey it's not a race you know enjoy the moment but it, you'll get there if it's fun but you know what and I'm very happy to see a lot of my friends a lot of family that they will put their kids in sports and making like everything possible for their own kids like like summer camp spring hockey camp power skating and it's great it, it keeps the kids engage and involved in sports instead to you know you stay staying home or uh go in a park or whatever but it, it's a great thing to do I, I appreciate to see all my family all my friends that involve their kids and push them to like hey spring hockey sport do it why not if you kind of can do it do it because i think at the end of the day uh, it's a great sport and we all love hockey and it's great and, and make those kids better person yeah yeah it's um I kind of go from like my own personal parenting philosophy. You know, my my boys love it. Um, they're all passionate about it. There's different levels, I think, of passion within them, right? My youngest is eight. My oldest is 11. So it's kind of interesting to just watch their personalities evolve with that. Yeah, they're all different. But yeah. um, ideally, I want them to be asking me when they can go out to the rink again, you know, like or when the next camp is or what they want to sign up for. So like I, I kind of take that approach of like I want them to be asking for more and not me giving them so much that, you know, they need a break kind of. So um because that's one thing I do see now is that the kids are playing hockey so much for so long, like all the time. You can play all, you can play 12 months a year now if you want to, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty crazy. And, you know, I think everyone has a different philosophy on that. I, I still like putting the skates away for a couple months and, you know, enjoying summer and, and letting them come back hungry. But let's talk about you. So, I mean, I noticed that your draft year, like you never played as a 16 year old in the queue. Why, why was that? Were you, were you in midget then at the time or where were you? Uh, yes, I think. And well, Back in the days, I think it's still like this in Quebec. I think in Alberta or in BC, there's a Bantam draft. It's so different, right? So, and 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 back in East, I think they're still drafting after your first year midget, not after your last year in Bantam. So, where uh, I was drafted at 16 years old, so after playing midget triple in the 16 years old, and at 15 year old midget triple eight, they cut me. I went back to Bantam, so I didn't play triple eight my first year midget triple e second year as a 16 years old i played triple e with the riverain uh, riverain year uh we won the air canada cup that year we uh we beat in the final quebec team we, we beat notre dame in the semi-final uh but you're right and i think that like i said earlier there's no rush like if you look at my path you know i play as a 16 year old midget triple e and 17 year old my first year was first draft in the quebec league as First overall, I was 17 year old, and I played 17, 18, 19 in the Quebec League in the junior. So you did go. You did go on the draft. Yeah, I was drafted as a. And you were first overall in that draft. Yeah, believe it or not, I mean that's that's kind no, of no, but that's that that's pretty. I'll cool, tell my back, I mean, of the, I, back of the self. You know, I was the first overall in the Quebec League that year in a queue. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's interesting because I mean, 16 year olds were allowed to play in that league, though, were they not? Uh, I don't think so. maybe. I don't think so. Or they have a special, uh, what do you call it? A special exemption. Exemption. Yeah. But huh. I do believe that. Uh, so basically, I was turning 17. Yeah. Well, you're drafted. I mean, same thing as me, right? So you, yeah. um, 
I, I played as a 16 year old, but, but if you were allowed to play there, I mean, there's a handful of guys in the WHL. There wasn't a ton of us, but there was enough, you know, there was enough that played at 16. So I got one year under my belt, a junior, and then I had my draft year, my second year. So um, if I remember, I do believe when I got drafted by Drummondville in the queue, I just turned 16. Mm -hmm. So I was 16, I guess. But right. when I start playing the next year, I turned 17, I guess. I, right, I right. mean, yeah. it, it, it is. At the end of the day, I feel like the different rules. Uh, for me, I still don't agree with the Bantam draft in, in the Western. Yeah. It, it is so young, but that's fine. I mean, they're so young. It, you got to get them young, I guess, now. But you know they what use... isn't fine about it, though? Because I agree with you. I think, it, like, why, why draft Why draft a, a, year, year, kid. A, year, a year ahead when they can't play? It doesn't make any sense, right? So, yeah. Um, so, so one, the, the, the two things that that happens there, Corbs, is that people you freak out even more, right? So now you're second year Bantam. Parents yeah. are freaking out because they want their kid to get listed or get drafted or whatever. Well, listed, you know? So right. now they're paying $30,000 to go to an academy or they got to make sure. So kids are leaving <laughs> yes. home at like 13 years old, right? Like to chase this so dream. So and young. it's like, what? Like if, if they would change that draft to first year midget, like it should be, um, yeah. you know, the kid can still play. And if you, and you get the exceptional uh, exceptional player status like Connor Bedard, so he enters the draft a year early. You know what I mean? You can still yeah, do and, that. And if you look right now, what's happening this year, because I got one 2006, his name is Nate, Nate Corbet. He will be, uh, he should be get his draft year should be in May coming up. But now with all this, you know, COVID-19 and restriction, now the, the WHL's draft is in December. And I'm happy with that because it gives the kids to grow until December Right. And start playing in September if thing goes back to normal, and they'll be able to watch those kids as almost like they're all turned fifteen now. They're older, they're stronger, they're better, and the draft in December. So I'm kind of glad the draft of the WHL in December now, not in May. Yeah. So it's almost you give the kids another like six months to grow and get stronger for the draft. Yeah. So no, it's perfect. I agree. But you know what I think they should do is actually like I don't even know why they have it in December. They should just like they should uh, mimic what the OHL is doing and draft first year midgets. Yeah. And then so they they just forget the draft this year and then they draft the same kids in the in the in the draft class next year, but it'll be first year midgets instead of second year bantams. You know what I mean? And then it's and then totally. it's the same. I think that would be a brilliant move. And then I wouldn't be battling my son in four years if he wants to go to an academy or not as a band. Not at all. It's crazy. But so, yeah, so you back uh, so back on your – so 91 draft, you end up going second round, 24th overall, which is a, you know, first rounder in, in, today's, in today's world. Did you know, like, you know, it was the hockey news was the Bible back in the day, right? I mean, there wasn't, there wasn't much else going on. There was the preseason report and, and the midseason draft report and then the one at the end of the year. Like, where did you – were you aware that you were on an NHL radar at the start, or when did that happen for you, and 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 what was that like? Uh, yes, I was. You know what? I've been to the combine, and I was actually, you know, been to top. I was ranked the top twelve, so I was supposed to go like top twelve in the first round, I guess, back in the days. And I was way ahead of uh, Tyler Wright. I I can't believe it. they drafted him before me, but that's fine. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so why are you picking on toe? Poor toe. Uh, I like toe. I mean, you yeah. always pick on me with my French and English all the time. But <laughs> we we went together on a plane. We, we went to New York. It was a combine in New York, and the, the top like first round guys were there in New York, do the chin ups and push ups and all that bike stuff. And you know, anyway. So when I did this, and I was very disapp not disappointed, but as a kid, you expect to be in the first round or the top. You know. Uh, 12 and also i remember like back in the days the montreal canadian says if you're not there on the 17th round we're gonna pick you for sure i mean this is great so like 14 now 15 16 17th montreal canadian and no they picked brad belotto i'm like okay so now i'm like what's going on i look at my agent like i i'm 17 years old i'm so so like nervous i'm like well, let's go don't worry You'll get picked. So all of a sudden, the Quebec Nordics picked me in the second round, and unfortunate, it was awesome because uh, the first round pick, as you know, uh, didn't put the jersey on. So when I put the jersey on, Lindros didn't, and I did. So it was awesome. Like people were going nuts. I'm like, Danny, I'm second, for you. I'm second round. I'm like, not the first round. <laughs> but I was, you know, that's that's the one thing. Like you never know. You know what? I was rank high, and I went the second round. But it's all good. I played a few games in the NHL, and I was right. lucky enough to get a Stanley Cup in Colorado. 
and it, it, yeah. it's all good. Yeah, I want to get to that Stanley Cup. That's super cool. But yeah, I mean, that's actually a similar story to mine. Like I was, I was told to my eyes by uh, by Cliff Fletcher, who was the GM of the Toronto Maple Leafs. It was just him and I in his hotel room, and he shook my hand. And he said, "I'll see you tomorrow. We're going to take you in the first round. You're going to be our first pick." Uh, he, like he told me he was going to trade up for me the whole nine yards. That was my last meeting of the draft. And uh, anyways, the next day rolled around and they never took me. And I sat and I sat and I sat and I sat and I went 31st and it felt like it was 331st, you know, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it, yeah. we both of us kind of sound probably stupid saying that now. I mean, everyone would love to get drafted, but I've talked about it before. It's the expectation, right? Like you thought well, you were going to go 12 and then you went 24. So it's like disappointing because you thought and, it was going to be and, something different. And right? Montreal can promise me a 17 still, they will take you. And it took right below though. And I think Brett, you know, he, he played a few games and he had a good courage, great, great defenseman. But, you know, it's it's a gamble. You don't know what's yeah. going on back in the seat, back in like the, the scouting and everybody involved and how they made a decision. And it's pressure too. They they, have, they have to pick somebody. Yeah, Your time comes, like, we're going to pick. And there's like five guys talking about everything probably, right? So, yeah. Anyway. yeah. Um, how come only 45 games that year, though? Did you get hurt that year or what? Uh, in Quebec? Yeah, your draft year. You had 45 games, your, your rookie season. Yes, the so I did get uh, the funnest thing, again, talking about the draft from Montreal Canadian and this. So my first year in the, the queue, I did get hurt. I had a, I got two chariots on my left leg, and uh, and I was really bad. And my coach was Jean Amel. So Jean Amel, Johnny Amel, is an ex-Canadian Montreal players he's a legend yeah. so jean mel was my coach and i got really badly hurt he says you're not Rennie. we're gonna send you to montreal Canadian to take care of this so every day i draw i drove my parents brought me to the montreal forum to get treatments in the locker room in montreal canadian wow Fees your guy so i was lucky enough as a seven 16 year old 17 year old go there get treatment on my leg and i remember the first couple i got there i got uh chris uh todd ewan Tough guy he was right there in the hot tub. Said, "Hey kid, if I'm gonna hot tub, wait. What? Well, the trainer told me to come here, so I was waiting. It, it was funny, but Montreal can into care of my leg and appreciate what he did for me uh, back in the days. And because of Jean Mel, uh, said he's one of the best players in the queue. We need to get some good treatment. You go to Montreal Canadian. They That's still awesome. didn't draft me. You they still have... draft. They right. still draft me." <laughs> you must have been nervous so hey that like walking well, into that locker room with all those guys how was that it was crazy and i walk around i see chris narland's name i see todd you and it was like all the mantra i was unbelievable i was so young and fortunate like uh i experienced that uh and i was so nervous actually when i went down the first time my feet i did some rehab and fees you and i got the hot tub and i missed a step and I fell forward and my leg snapped and I'm, I'm just crying. The Fiso guy said, this is great. Now you just gain like 2% more flexibility. You just break the, you just oh, break really? the, yeah, it was like, this is great. I'm like, but anyway, uh, no, I was very nervous. And uh, again, I was very fortunate to be part of uh, uh, these guys that take care of my leg. And be, before that, they saved my career probably. I would never play probably. Wow, it was, was that bad, eh? That's terrible. Yeah. Um yeah, I, I good remember, numbers. I think forty-five games. They got numbers. Good numbers, no? No, no, no. Yeah, you had sixty-five points, man. It's a really good season, but, obviously. But, but it I looked came, like I, uh, but it I looked like back, in the playoffs you really came alive, though. You had eleven goals in yeah. fourteen games, and that probably really helped your, uh, you know, whatever your rankings and stuff there. And, I would guess. Yeah, and that year we came back. I came back that year, like I said, in the playoff, and we went to the Merrill Cup, and we lost against the Chiefs, Spokane Chief. So that that year I was hurt the whole year, like forty-five game. I got hurt. I came back for the playoff. And we went to the Merrill Cup and lost in the final against uh, Trevor wow. Kibbs, a goalie. Yeah, John Pat Clem, Falloon, a, Ray Whitney. Pat Falloon, they had, uh, Whitney, they have an unbelievable Paparowski. team. These guys were yeah, to pros. I was they, there, I, man. I was there. What what team? What well, I, I was I was 13, though, because I was listed by them. So that was the team that I they, they listed me when I turned 13. Like, that was back before the Bantam draft. I think like my Bantam draft, there was me, Jeff Friesen, <laughs> And one other guy, Clayton, um, Travis Clayton, were, th were the three players that weren't eligible for the Bantam draft because we had already been taken in the old system, you know? Yeah. And okay, um, yeah. 
Yeah. And so then I was, uh, so they invited me to the Memorial Cup because I was, you know, part of their future. I'm supposed to be like, you know, like their future you're, big you're guy. You're the Black Aces. You're, the, you're on a B team. Called well, that. yeah, but I, I was with my family just cruising around, but I was in the dressing awesome. room after they, that's so wild. What a small world. I was in the dressing room when they won it afterwards, like sitting there with the boys yeah, at 13 so, years old. And that was, so that was cool. the year I was injured, but I came back for the playoff, a great playoff. 11 goals, like you said. I, I, I took the team to the Memorial Cup, basically. And it was me and Ian Lapierre and Patrice Bruzbois. We're, we're a good team. And we went to the final, and we lost in the final against uh, Spokane. It was yeah. like the Whitney, Falloon guys, Toporowski, Trevor, Trevor Kidd, John Clem, I think, was there. They had yeah. a good team. It was, yeah. it was tough. But, you know, it was a good, good experience. Yeah, that's wild. So yeah, so you get um that's really cool too. So you you get drafted the same year as Lindros. Lindros doesn't put on the doesn't put on the jersey. I mean, for those of you who listening here who don't know that story, I mean, Lindros was, you know, the next coming uh, essentially, right? He was he was the next huge thing. Um dominated junior hockey uh and and was public about him not going to Quebec for whatever reason, right? He he wasn't going to go to Quebec. Uh he doesn't even show up at the draft table, doesn't put on the jersey. And uh, and then they make that trade, which which essentially, like, which is so wild too, because, I mean, that trade is, is what got you guys, like, your Stanley Cup was was because Lindos didn't want to go there. You know, it yeah. was uh, such a such a weird way that hockey world works. But, um, yeah, I, I want to get into your last year. So you, so you, you get drafted. Actually, you know what? Let's talk about your first camp. So you get drafted. Yeah, so, you know, second round, twenty fourth overall, maybe a little bit of a chip on your shoulder because you thought you should have been a first rounder, and you you show up there. Now you're now you're at camp, and the first guy isn't there. So now you're kind of the big dog from that draft class. What was that first experience like going to going to NHL camp? Well, it it was pretty uh, pretty 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 cool and, and amazing. A little bit of a pressure, but I think they can't compare me to coming up from the junior, all those goals. And I'm, I'm like, you know, from midget, triple A, from all my background, like this guy is the next Michel Goulet. He's going to score 50 goals in the NHL. I'm like, so a bit of a pressure on that side of it. But uh, I went to Quebec and I came in all of a sudden, I did my first camp and uh, uh, I did okay. And, you know, still kind of a shy guy. I'm only 17 and I want to do something st- I won't say stupid, but I want to make sure I do a statement. Uh, I got this guy, I think is uh, yeah, Russian or yeah, Russian guy, uh, Andre Kovalenko. So I got involved with him on the ice, and he's not a fighter. I'm not a fighter. I score goals all the time. And he asked me, let's go. Let's rub the glove. <laughs> so I'm like, really? I'm like, I'm like, I'm 17. You're like, I don't know, I know how Andre Kovalenko was. So I, I dropped the glove. And no, no, no. I'm like, no. And all of a sudden, he suck him, punch me, boom, broke my nose. I'm bling everywhere. And I'm like, wow, welcome to the NHL. And I'm like, it's the first thing. And you know what? And I, and I put my, you know, get up and went to the doctor, get my nose fixed. And I was right back at it. And I was like, no problem. You know what? I'm going to make this team. And I'm glad because I keep going, put myself in a good situation. And four years after that, I took a spot. It was traded to the Montreal Canadian from the Avalanche for Quebec. And that's why I made the team and I won the cup. So I was lucky. <laughs> Broke my nose, made the, made, won the cup. <laughs> that's crazy. Um, yeah, I mean, I remember my first camp too. It was, uh, again, it was a new experience. I mean, new experience. It's, it's not like playing in the NHL, obviously. But, I mean, you get yeah. your exhibition games. You get to be around NHLers, right? Like you're you're rubbing you're rubbing elbows with them. It's pretty pretty cool experience. You... You have another great year, your second year. Your, let's, let's talk about your third year, though. I mean, your third year, you score 79 goals in Drummondville, uh, lead the entire league in points, lead the entire league in goals. Um, geez, in Canada, I, probably. In Canada, too, maybe. I would assume, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, that, you, was the, that was usually the case with the Q, because you, you, I would actually was going to give you crap over that, because if you didn't score 50 in the Q, you were absolutely nobody, because it seemed like anybody could do that. <laughs> that's what I have the best. <laughs> That's why they have the best goaltender. They have lots of shots on goal. <laughs> you guys didn't like playing defense out there or what? No. It's like spring hockey. Go, go. <laughs> but, How was that, uh, though? I mean, so w- did you get an invite that year? I-, I never saw if you played World Junior or not. Did you Did you play World Junior or did you Did you get an invite to that camp? This is a this is a kind of a, a subject that Ooh, it's I great to talk nerve. about it. I hit no, a nerve. You know, you know what? I'm, if I look back right now, uh, it's okay, you know. And 
Yes. Should I be on that team? Yes. Uh, they didn't pick me. That's okay. They, they told me I was uh, not a very good skater. That's why, they, when I, you know, and it's okay because not everybody's a great skater, but uh, yes, it was a great year. I was fortunate to play with Ian LaPerriere, uh, my sentiment, and him and I were just killing it. Like, Ian had a great, you know, Ian LaPerriere play uh, for the Kings and Philly, Avalanche. So it was my sentiment. So, uh, but yes, I went to the camp and I got a knock on the door. It says, you're going home, kid. And there was no, uh, and back in the days, you know, they, they're looking at bigger kids, like stronger, uh, like they want like, they, they, they make it a team as they pick the first line, second line, third line, fourth line. It's a team. They don't need five scoring goals. Guys, and these guys can kill penalty, block shots, and all that kind of respect. And I respect yeah. that. And they did pick me, and that was fine. They said, you know what? Uh, we're going to Russia. I think it was Russia, and it's a big heist. And you know what? Your skating is not there to be on big heist. And yeah. I got I got cut. And you know what? From that, you learn, and you just keep going because adversity makes you a better person, a better player at the end of the day. And it helps me. That's yeah. it. You didn't know. I bet you didn't know it at the time, though. I bet you were pissed off, and I bet you were mad. You know, like that's the thing. Like when you're oh, in totally. it in the moment, it's like God. You can't really see the silver lining. But what what was your lesson there? Did was it something that you did? Did you did you work on your skating for maybe for instance? Like was that something that you or was no. you just out to prove them wrong? How how did that go? No, and and, and it, the skating thing part was always with me since I was young. But I put the puck in the net, so it was not a big deal. Like, hey, I remember. You, Pots, you, you beats me all the time and we skate together. You always, you was the first you're scanning hard and stuff. Like you're cheating a little bit. I'm not cheating. So I, I do stop and starts. So you're like turning, but that's fine. So, but we always like, I'm not a good, I'm never a good skater, but my IQ and everything else was really good. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, if you look at this, it's, I'm not grinch about this. Am I mad? Like, like now, look at my boys. But back in the days as well, uh, it was always a little bit more Western player playing than Quebec player on yep. Team Canada. Now it's now it's changing now, and I don't want to say it's a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. And but back in the days, it was really hard to break the Western uh, boys out of the lineup to play in the World yeah, Junior they're... Championship. Thank you so much for listening today. Uh, just a quick reminder about upmyhockey.com. That's where you can find anything up my hockey related. That means uh, my team services offers. That means my personal client one-on-one -on -one services. That also means my family membership services. There's three ways uh, that you can utilize up my hockey and the mindset program and the character development that comes along with that. Uh, I am filling up for the fall as I'm taking on new teams and academies to work with. Uh, if you think that uh, adding mental high-performance training to your team's program or to your academy's program is something that makes sense, uh, by all means, check out upmyhockey.com. You'll see what it's all about, what types of things I offer, and uh, I would love to have the opportunity to work with you. Uh, also, parents and players out there, uh, currently my, uh, my private client list is full, but if that's something that, uh, entertains you or you're interested about, by all means, reach out and, um, and maybe we can get on a, on the wait list and, and when a spot opens up, we can start working together as I, I do really like my time working with players one-on-one. -on -one. It, it gives the most value to the player. Uh, it's a lot of, uh, investment emotionally for me. It's like, it's like adding another, uh, another son into my family or, or daughter for that matter but uh, but it's something that I take seriously and I really enjoy extracting every ounce of potential out of the players out there so once again it's at myhockey.com if you want to know more about what it looks like uh, to work with me as a team or as an individual now back to the program with Rene Corbet the, w, right? the WHL club. Yeah, or the W yeah. the O. There was always – we had uh, Jose Theodore on my team and, and Mark Denis. Or the goalies were usually like the ones, right? And then yeah. we also – There's got uh, so much shots on goals. Yeah. Denny the Gauthier goalies. was there. Um, Christian Dubé. We had a few um, few few players. But, yeah, it was – I mean, for instance, like our year, you're right, though. Our coach was from the WHL, was Marcel Como. And yeah. um, and I think we probably had 10, 10, probably 11 guys from the WHL right on that team. 
Um, and and that was that was the case some years. I, I found it was the case of like who that you, coach was, right? You want to go middle with it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, with yeah. the Genla. So that was like, that's it was awesome. Like, yeah, it was, it was really good. You know what? And, and and at the end of the day, this is amazing. It's one thing I miss on, on my resume. Yeah. I wish I would have a gold medal or actually or be in the team or play yeah. the World Junior, but I didn't. That's okay. Yeah. That was one of the things talking with Danny Briere. I know he told you uh, he was a guest here before, but he got uh, caught, caught twice, right, at camp. And it's kind of a similar story, right? Was crushing it in the queue, got cut twice, and then he made it that third year and he won his gold medal. And that was kind of one of the, you know, big highlights for him and yeah. in his journey. Um, you take the step into pros after that. So, you mean, you you win everything you can win, yep. essentially, as a, as a queue. Uh, confidence, I assume, is sky high, feel, feel like you're a world beater. Um, and you roll into camp there. I, I see you played nine games that year. Did you make the team out of camp, or were those call-up games? Uh, those were call-up games. So basically, uh, at 20, year, 20 years old, I was 20 years old, went to camp, and, and I went a really good camp in Quebec, but they still cut me because the contract situation, they have no room for me. So they sent me back to the uh, Cornwall Aces in Ontario. So I went back to the Miners. And great year. I was 20 years old. I got the rookie of the year that year. I don't know if you know that, but I got yeah, the rookie of the that. year. Yeah. Like it's that's a good thirty-seven goals, whatever miss assists. So it was great year for me. But they did call me out for a month. They, they, I remember they say, uh, "You're not gonna fly. Take your car to Quebec City. You want to stay for a month or two. I'm like, "Oh, this is awesome. I'm taking my car. I'm driving on a highway from Cornwall to Quebec. I'm there for a month or two. So that's why I played those nine games. That year, oh, that's sweet, yeah, and that's why I got my first NHL goal. That yeah, I was going to ask you about that. How was how was that goal? Who was it against? Oh, it was great. You know what? You probably won't guess who against me, but this like I, this is a good trivia with my friend. The story I tell my friends and family. Who has got my first NHL goal? They're like, guess it was a goal in Dallas. They're like, they name Andy Moog. They're like, really, Andy Moog. That's all how old I am right now. Andy Morgan. That's how I score my goal. You couldn't get fight. You couldn't get down his knees. It was like on the ice. I score on the ice. I was like, <laughs> but, oh my yeah. goodness, that's wild. So when um yeah, I was gonna say, I mean, congratulations on that season. I mean, it's, so you go from leading the queue, um, all of all of major junior hockey in points. That you you lead your team in points as a twenty year old, uh, and win the rookie of the year there. So you're still still riding high. And and then you go up there and you get you get your first uh, your first apple in the show, which is super cool. Was that your first experience in Cornwall, like in a, in an English speaking town at that point? Yes. And how was well, that transition for you? You know, it, it was pretty. It, it was okay. You know what? And uh, and Cornwall was also a very French town as well. So mm. people kind of so. It, but it was nervous, like and no offense it, as a. I'll be very honest. I went there and I, I found it, my parents found me a billets. I actually lived with a billets kind of in the basement at my own basement apartment. I was 20, 21 years old, living in a basement with uh, this nice couple upstairs and, but in my own kitchen and everything else, but it was still living with a family. I was not by myself. Uh, and it would speak French and English and it was good, a good transition, but uh, that was really my first time that I moved away from home and, Getting the bus and the guys are talking with me and like you don't speak English? No, I don't. But you know what? We're gonna work on this and you know we'll make fun of you, Renee. We'll talk about table talk or playing cards and have some fun. And, and you know what? And I respect all the joke the guys said to me because you know what? It was fun. The guys enjoyed that. They're right. laughing at me, but they're laughing with me. It was awesome. All right. And so you, you you learned English on on the job then essentially is that how you learned it in the dressing room or did you end up taking classes how, how did that go no, for you I, I really learned English playing cards in the bus going those big trips in like Rochester and uh, Albany uh, what, what uh, bus it was like with the boys the boys the, they were my teachers and yeah. the coaches and the playing hockey it was that's how I learned to speak English I guess good for you good for you uh, coming off that year though Corb so like I mean. You were high draft pick. You I mean you you do essentially everything that you could you could do as a rookie in, in the A that year, and then you don't make the team again the next year. Like, is there are you starting to get rattled, or did you not have as good of a camp? Or I mean, how did that whole whole thing go, and how did you deal with with not making the squad there your second year? 
uh, it, it, it was it was it was hard and disappointed. You know, like you're 20 years old, 21 years old, you, you go it's quite a lineup. And as you know, uh, the Quebec Nordiques and the Avalanche now uh, that lineup was tough to crack. They all had those first round pick and stuff, and uh, I and it, it was really hard. But you know what? I had a good mentor, good coaches. I've you know, Jean Martin, I've Barb Hartley in the manners. I had all those coaches. Like you know what? They very tell me to never quit, and I'm not a quitter. And that, that's one thing I teach my boys: uh, don't quit, because you know you never know what's going to happen. It could be in two years from now, in three from now. Don't quit because uh, that's life. And if you keep pushing, you'll be successful if you don't quit. When you quit, it's over. So I think that's what I did. And I didn't quit. I put my head down, keep working hard, listen to my coaches in, in Cornwall. And I was like, I got a break. And I deserved the break. But I, I did have to keep going and change my style and be more – defensively minded and offense offense is great but at one point you need both you need yeah. play defense and play offense you need to be you know both ways were you actually were you at the point where you were considering like not playing like were you that were you that mad or did you get to that never no. never you know what you know what it, this is uh i was very passionate and the only thing i can do is play hockey for the rest of my life you know and uh as a young boy at 20 21 years old if you have a goal, even if you're like 15 or 13 years old, play hockey as long as you want because, you know what, it's a great sport. It's a team sport. You enjoy the boys, your friends, your teammates, your coaches. It's a great life to do it. Don't quit because I didn't want to quit. I was like, you know what, if I, if I can play in a minor for 20 years, I'll play in a minor for 20 years, but I won't quit. I love to play hockey. That's a, the game I love. Yeah, good for you. Uh, so yeah, so you got that second year. Have another solid season your second year, and then it seems like your you know your bigger break there. I don't know if you made the team out of camp or not. Was that your third season pro? You ended up getting the thirty three games. You ended up winning the cup um, yeah. against my Florida Panthers, where I was a black ace again. Our paths crossed oh, again. Were, that's yeah. funny. That's awesome. Isn't that crazy? The, with the rats, um, eh? All the rats. Yeah, with the rats. What um, what was that like? Did you make the team out of camp that that year when the, when the team transitioned to Colorado? Yes. So that year when the team moved to Colorado, I didn't make the team. I was there for like three three weeks. And I, was, I played the first four games, I think. And I made the team. And uh, out of a son, I think the third week I was there, there's a trade. They traded somebody, someone from Claude Lemieux. So Claude Lemieux came from, from New Jersey to Colorado. So when Claude came as a forward, so they had to send somebody down. I was the one who got sent down. And I, I was bawling. I was crying in the bathroom, just devastated. I was like, are you kidding me? I finally made the team. I got the picture of the first game in Colorado. I got everything. I feel like I'm in the team. So Claude Lemieux knocked, knocked the bathroom door in the bathroom. He said, Corbs, he said, you'll be back. I'm so sorry. So you'll be back. Keep going, kid. I'm like, sure, I'm bawling. He's like, you're going to go. I'm going to minors. You're, you're here. So I know. I went to the minors. And First game against to Cornwall, I blew my knee out. I'm out oh, for six weeks. Oh, no God. So, yeah. So my coach was Bob Hartley, and he's like, it's okay. It's okay. Keep rehab and everything. So, anyway, long story short, Claude Lemieux came for the trade. They sent me back in the minors. December 3rd, when that big trade happened with Patrick Waugh, uh, uh, Mike King for Carl Valenko and Jocelyn Thibault, they called me back up. And I, would, I just came back, play one game, and they called me back up. So it was kind of cool. It wasn't my turn to be up. So because I was there, sent me down up. I was hurt. And it, it, it just happened the right way. I was really yeah. lucky. Right. Yeah, that's uh, that's a pretty class move by Claude. Eh? So Claude – and Claude actually – obviously he, he – arrived after the trade and you were still there. I mean, a lot of times that wouldn't happen, right? You'd been, you'd have been yeah. released already. Well, but I was so there for a week after that, like scratch, L to scratch. And oh, okay. of a, yeah, L to scratch. And I was saying like the roster is tight. Rene, go back to the minors. I'm like, okay. Right. So I was kind of devastated, but you know what? I remember December 3rd, that trade, uh, I was in a plane from Montreal airport with me, Patrick Waugh and Mike King were in a private jet going to Colorado. It was a big trade. So I got to the airport. So they're like, from Cornwall, I said, go to the airport. You're on a plane with Patrick and Mike King. So I got to the airport. The press was like, unbelievable. 
right. Chris Patrick and my kid, big trade, right? So I'm at the airport. I'm coming in with my hockey bag and a couple suitcases. I mean, they're like, what's the plane this way? They're like, this way. You go there, they'll talk to these guys. But I was the play with those guys. And and, and when I went back, it was my break. It was actually, that's the time I went. December 3rd, 2000, or, or not, yeah, 19. Anyway, it was a long journey. And it was feels so good. Right. That day, I knew I was going there and not coming back to play the minors. That, that's what I feel like it was like the time. Oh, you just so that was just a feeling you had in your gut. You're like, I, I'm here now. I'm a yeah. I'm you know what? Uh, I was there for three weeks, get set down and the trade, and I get called up again. I was like, this is it. You know what? I'm not going back. And, but still, December third, I was staying in the hotel for until January 24th, until we came back from a road trip from Boston, and the coach waved at me. He said, "Come here." And, oh no, I'm in trouble. He said, "Renee." Go find your own apartment. You're here for the rest of the year. I'm like, yes. <laughs> the oh. best feeling ever, right? Yeah, you know no that. kidding. Yeah. Oh. I've talked to guys about that before. I, those are words I never heard, unfortunately. But boy, I wish <laughs> I wish that I did. You know, like what a what a great feeling that is to get out of the hotel and you know, to feel like you really to exhale and believe that you you belong, right? Yeah. So crazy. That's awesome. They uh that team, man. It's like so now. You you feel that you've you you're one of the guys you you feel like you're an NHLer and you're on one of the best teams in hockey with some just amazing players. What uh, how did you fit into that and how did you know what your role was and how you were going to be successful in that environment? Well, I'm a big believer that uh, when I was there, I can do I can I can do whatever the coach or people wants me to do. I can I can score goals. I can be defensively. Uh, I was like a support guy, you know. I can I can be in the first line, second line, turn line, and then I. But most of the time, my role was, you know what, be energy guy, Renee. You, you know, uh, you're an exciting guy. You bring some life to the locker room on the ice. Uh, you can score. That's what we want you to do. Like you know, I was fortunate. Like uh, when I was in Colorado, Mark Crawford was very good to me in the sense that he tell me what I need to do. And it was great. He, 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 he was very honest with me. So, Rene, we want you to be that guy. Uh, and somebody said, Rene, you got to stop now because we don't want you to get hurt. You're playing hard against, like, tough guys right now. He's like, you know, take it easy a bit, you know. You have a 10 fight this year. Like, you don't need to fight every night. <laughs> it's like, you're small. Take it easy. But Were you, you, were you fighting? You were fighting quite a bit? Yeah, you know, the second year in Colorado after winning the cup that, that year, I got 11 major. And that's a lot of fight, 11 majors, a lot of fight. But, you know, and I was playing so hard and intense and stuff. So, obviously, you know, it works back in the days, not now. But they always say, you know what, if you're going to play that style of hockey, you have to be responsible for your action, right? So, and it was responsible for action. I was right. just, you know, if you do that stuff, you'll, you'll put up to it. Well, that's the interesting thing that I've talked about before. You I mean, and, and so you you fit into this environment where you you have a Forsberg, you have Sackick, you have you know these players uh, that are obviously putting the puck in the net and they're in the power play. Yeah, you've scored seventy nine goals in junior, and you led your team in points in the AHL. But you still there's only so many guys in a team, and not everybody can do the same thing. Um, so you end up being a guy that's not looked upon or leaned upon to, to be offensive. And now you're fighting and now you're laying body checks and now you're providing energy was, uh, were you thankful to, to have that opportunity or was there part of you that was, uh, you know, w wished maybe you were given a different opportunity? Uh, I'm, I'm thankful that I made the NHL and I played in NHL as long as I did. And when I stand I'm very thankful and what I can, I, 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 I got lots of friends like playing NHL and stuff, but at the end of the day, it's really hard to adjust. Like, it's, and I did adjust to what they, what they want me to do. But uh, a, lot of, a lot of my friends are way better occupied than I am. And, but you know what? At the end of the day, they didn't adjust. You have to adjust the system. You have to respect. You have to understand what they want from you. And you have to take it. You have to take the opportunity to do it. If you don't do it, well, you're going to play in the minor or East Coast League for a few years. And, uh, you know, but if you want to take that challenge and do what he wants you to do, you'll make it. And that's what I did. I was fortunate, like, I adjust my game. Uh, uh, 
Well, I guess my game, I mean, with the most ice time I got play in Colorado and stuff, I still score 16 goals, 15 goals a year. So it's not that bad if you think about it. Yeah. Uh, but you have to adjust your adjust the way they want you to do. Right. Yeah, and that's the thing, right? You do need to reinvent yourself and constantly be looking for ways to contribute, totally. right? In the yeah. in the way in the way that they want you to. Who, looking back on that team now, you I mean I'm looking at the names here right now: so Forsberg, Sakic, Ozilinc, Kamensky, Deadmarsh, like Corbet, Corbet, yeah, <laughs> Lemieux, right? Wa, Adam oh, Foot, um, Uwe Krupp, like I mean, a lot, big name after big name. I played. I played against uh, Deads growing up uh, in, in in when he was in Portland. So we we played we played against each other a few times. Daddy, Adam Denmarsh. Yeah, yeah, Adam Daddy. Denmarsh. Yeah. He was like, it's it's weird for me to say that be, because he was a peer of mine. I think he was only a year older than me. But I always like really liked him as a hockey player. Like I, I thought that he played hard. I thought he was smart. You know, he could fight. He could score. Um, what did you think of Deads? Did did you did, did you appreciate him too? Totally. And I still talk to Deddy. I talked to him last week, two uh, three weeks ago. Uh, I love Adam. Adam was like one of my guy looking for it. Like, I, look, I look at this kid because he's younger than me. And I said, call him kid. But this guy's he's working hard. He scores goals. He fights. I want to be like him to make the lineup and be in the lineup. Uh, uh, Adam DeMarsh, you know what? He, this total package. Like you can fight, you can play hard, kill penalty, play in the power play, can score, score goals. Like I'm very proud of that guy. Like, like I talked to him like three weeks ago. We reconnect with the uh, when we have a Colorado uh, Avalanche 25 years anniversary on Zoom, and he was there, and cool. a lot of guys were there. Yuri Kuh was on the on the call. Uh, Sylvain Lefebvre. It was it was awesome reunion we did about That's a month great. ago. That's and, awesome. and I'm and now like we're talking about my kids because now Adam is uh, is part of the Spoken now. Yeah, Spoken. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I want to have him on as a guest too. He's assistant, he's assistant coach there. I definitely want to chat with him, and even yeah. about his career. Obviously, the stuff that he went through with his head and you know the concussions yeah. and everything else. It's, so uh, I look don't, talking about him about hockey. He's a total role model. The way you play, the way you work hard every day, in and out. Like that's amazing what he did. Yeah. Back, looking back on those teams, and you're a young guy coming up. You know, uh, was was anybody a mentor there or a role model to you that that helped that helped you? Uh, you know, get through or somebody that you could lean on a little bit. Well, uh, I, to be honest with you, uh, I, I will say there's one guy that really helped me go through the adversity that I have to deal with, uh, being up and down, and up from the Cornwall Aces, up and down, and that trade. And it was Mike Keen. Uh, me and Mike Keen, uh, we stayed at the hotel for about a month and a half together. And we drove together for every practice every day and game every day. And Mike was a good mentor to me. And Mike Keen is one of the leader, Like, you know, he's a captain and he, you know Montreal. And Mike Keen, it, it was awesome to me. Uh, we used to drive together all the time. And they say, kid. I'm like, time to scratch. I'm like, oh, you'll be in the lineup tonight. I'm telling you, I might be able to scratch. It's okay, Bernie. He's like, yeah. he was always good to me. Like, I would say he was one of one of the top leader I've ever met in my life, Mike King. That's cool. So, I, I mean, I love talking about leadership and how guys go out of their way sometimes. And I mean, that's and something that's the most memorable thing that you'll have. I mean, like, obviously, yeah. you won the Stanley Cup. You remember that, but you remember those relationships and those guys that you know, took the time, right, to to include you and to make you feel welcome. What 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 were some of the characteristics of Mike that you thought made him such a good leader? Well, you know, Mike, it was always like kind of a listening and when it was time to talk, it was talking. And also it was always one of those guys like we'll drive together and say, like, Corbs, this music is terrible. Don't be a loser. We gotta turn on music. We don't need Celine Dion on the, on the radio. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, we're driving. So, no, I'm not kidding. We're driving and at a CD. Back in the day, CD used to put in the, in the car. And it, it will press exit and to the CD off the window on the highway. <laughs> but ne the next day, I'll buy the same CD, put it back in the car again. Again, turn the highway. So I'll buy like five same CDs. And I always turn it out the window on the way to the rink. I said, Mike, come on. I won't play. You're going to pay for those CDs? Like, no. Don't buy the same CD again. Bad music. But he was a good, like, good guy to, you know what? Uh, you, you know, Mike, the way he plays on the ice can tell everything. Mm -hmm. 
right? Yeah. Tough. Got like Mike was a really good player. Uh, good with the guys, the locker room. Did you ever play with Mike or no? I never played with him. No, I, I talked with um, Brad Larson was a guest uh, for, for, of mine. I, yeah. I, I remember him, and he uh, he was with. I mean, he never won the cup with Colorado, but he was there. And it, him, and now he's coaching. I don't know if you know that with Columbus, but he was just talking about like that culture there and like how how accountable like that dressing oh, room was. Yes. He's like, you know, everything was about winning. Period. You know, like that's that was the bar, that was the standard, and that was the 100%. only thing that mattered. Yeah. Can you can you describe like what that's like being in an environment like that compared to because you you weren't on always on on winning teams, right? In the NHL, like what that feels like, like what that culture piece feels like when everyone's being held to that standard. Well, you know, I, I was lucky. I was fortunate, lucky enough that I play in Colorado. And I play for the Calgary Flames, and I play also with Pittsburgh Penguins. And we have, you know, when Mario Lemieux came back there, and the Penguins, I was fortunate I was there. And uh, so I play with a lot of few teams that the culture is amazing. They're winners like Jagger, Lemieux, uh, Stevens, and Pittsburgh. That's it, it, amazing. I was fortunate. I'm fortunate in Colorado especially as well with Patrick and Claude Lemieux. How many Stanley Cups do these guys have? It's crazy. And the culture, it, it, it is pretty special. And we have a few meetings, and I won't lie, and I can say that now. Uh, you're in the locker room, and another son says, guys, get in your stall. We have a meeting in two minutes. And our son, who runs a meeting, it's Patrick Wah, Claude Lemieux, and Sakic. And they all talk about now the coach will come in. And the coach coming after that, and they're like, it's almost like we didn't need any coaches because we have those guys that are like, guys, it's time to wake up, get back to work. We need to get back to winning and do the little things we do as a best as a team, right? Yeah. Yeah, the Larson's saying, was, like, he would say, like, there was, like, actual, like, FU matches, like, between the best in the room, like, calling each other out, like, in the best way possible, though, right? Like 100%. That, 100%. Yeah. These guys always put each other on the edge, and they put the young guys on the edge because we're young, and we're, like, out of a sudden, like, holy you know, we got to be careful because we're going to get it. <laughs> but they all put everybody, but accountable. They make sure you're accountable to what you're going to do to make the team winning in and out every day. So it's important that they make sure they want to win. They're winners like Patrick, Claude Lemieux, Pepe, uh, Sackett, and name it, Forsberg. They're all winners. And when I went to Pittsburgh, same thing. Jagger, when Mario Lemieux came back, when I played, I was fortunate, I was like, wow. The room just changed. All of a sudden, it's like we're gonna win. It's like it's amazing. Yeah, that's wild. I want to talk about Mario, so I don't let me forget because well, I won't because he's he was my absolute like he was my idol growing up. You know, I mean, like I I, I worship the ground that he walked on. So I want to talk about Mario, but I want to get just just finish the the talk about the cup. You know, you, you go there. You end up playing eight games um, and had, had a good eight games, looks like, and three goals, two assists. Uh, was Were any of those big goals uh, during that run, like that, you know, were, 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 were difference makers in, in some games? Well, actually, well, the, it's funny you're saying that because the first round we played against uh, Vancouver, and I didn't play the first four games. And and I get, actually, I get called, I get – I'm in now for the fifth game, and it's like I think it's two-two or two-one, and I scored a third goal, huge goal to change the momentum. It's just awesome, and you know what? You're 23 years old. It's just awesome. And I'm like, yes, and I'm going back the next day. You know, you're out. You don't, and you scratch for the old game next game, and the old next round against Chicago. Some of a sudden, you score a big goal, game six. You don't play the next round against Chicago. Like, okay, just keep bag your skate, you skate out, down red. But you know what? That's all you do it. You just keep going, you know, keep going. And all of a sudden, I got a break against Detroit uh, when uh, Claude Lemieux uh, accidentally hit Draper on the board. Uh, so I, he was suspended for a couple of games. So I got my break there and they put me back in the lineup and I, I score, I got an assist thing in Detroit. And I think when we went to the final against uh, Florida, uh, Patrick Wayne Sackett kind of stood up for me because they, the coaches and the staff, they're asking, hey, what should we do? 
Corbett or Chris Simon in the lineup or this guy in the lineup? What should we do? They, they vouch for me. Get Corbett in the lineup. Energy guy. He won't cost you. We'll do anything stupid. So I was in the lineup. All of a sudden, game two in Colorado, I scored two goals against Florida. Well, it was 7-1 blowout, but still. That's awesome, man. Two goals in the Stanley Cup final. That's super cool. Um, was that which one was the toughest series? I mean, I know you guys swept us in Florida. I mean, I'll tell you my little funny story. I, I uh, so I just finished my last year of Spokane. We got to the WHL final, and I was, le- I mean, uh, I was playing my best hockey of my career at that point. I led the WHL in, in goals, and and they and they called me up. And the first game I was supposed to play, like on arrival, Ray Shepard was hurt, and we were playing against Boston. And I was like in the locker room, like re- getting ready for the game, showed up, had my suit on. And all of a sudden, Ray Shepard walks through the door and had some like miracle, miracle healing nap or something. And uh, and he played that game. And then I never I never got in the lineup. I mean, they just went on that run. Right. And, and I was a black ace the entire time. So I was this close to playing my first game in the NHL as a as a playoff game, but uh, was there and saw you um, race the Stanley what? Cup, I guess. Isn't that yes, crazy? That- yeah, that, that, that's crazy. You know what? I, I was very fortunate. And from these days, I was on the ice. I, I was on that team the last day. I was 20, we're talking about like 23 years ago. Like, it's amazing. Like, right now, I don't realize it, but I was, I was young. I was 23 years old. And you got to be fortunate. Like, uh, you look at the kids now. I look at my boys now. Guys, enjoy every moment now because those moments will never go back. Like you have to enjoy it. every time you win a championship. It doesn't matter if it's SO minor hockey or any championship you won hockey. Enjoy every championship because this is a special moment. Oh my goodness, yeah, for sure. I mean, not to mention a Stanley Cup, the biggest of all championships. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Uh second year, the next year you guys lose in the third round, correct? To um to Detroit. Yep. How was uh like those like those series cool. were just insane series. I mean that must be a highlight. Even though you lost uh, to them that year, like those, I mean th- th- there wasn't much better hockey. I mean back in the nineties, like the Colorado versus Detroit, that was where it was at. Oh yeah, it was a war. Like every day you get up in the morning to go play against these guys, like like you 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 shake. It's like what's gonna happen today? It's like a it's a battle battle to become. And and it was good, you know and. If I look back now, I really appreciate the way we respect each other at the end of the day. We did like we battled hard, we fought each other. But you know what? It was for one goal. It was for the, the cup. That's the only thing we fight about. It was the cup, and that's how much it's tough to win the cup. You have to fight about it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. How many Hall of Famers were on the ice in those series? Right? Oh. Like it's it's like crazy, right? I mean, like oh. Law, Sakic, Forsberg, Lidstrom, Datsuk, I, you know, I mean, like Eisenman, whatever. Like, yeah, I, I mean, like, I'm forgetting Hall of Famers. Do you know what I mean? Like Hasek, you know, like it's um, crazy when you get the when you start thinking about who was there, and that was just such good hockey. What um, you know, you you had your your two best seasons as far as from point production were your first two there. You had said you mentioned you had 12 goals and 16 goals. Um, 133 pims that second season, which obviously you said you're, you mean, must 11, been doing fights, quite a, 11 yeah, fights. <laughs> yeah, must have been doing a lot of fighting. Uh, when did you, like, I don't know, like, like, you do things to get into the league, and then sometimes you have to do things to stay in the league, of course, yeah. you know. Um, did you realize at any point that probably the goal scoring thing is not going to work out at this level? And if so, why do you think it didn't work out at that level? Are they just too good there? Uh, Oh yes, obviously, and uh, and I realized that right away. I was 22 years old after my two years at the Mariners, like like rookie of the year, lots of goals and stuff. And and they wouldn't call me up, so they didn't really need me to go play in her leagues and score some goals. So at one point, and my coaches were very really good to me. Like Rene, you have to be more defensively minded. You have to play defensively. You have to block shot because I know we can score a goal. But we don't think you can play defensively. So when you, you want to play in the big show, you have to play both ways. And you have to be an all-around player. Like, if you look at Joe Sackett, yes, top scoring all the time, Forsberg, but these guys can play both ways as well. They can kill them. They, like, so they told me, like, you have to adjust, you know. And it, it, if you look back to your question right now, I do have to adjust. And you know what? I, I'm glad, but it's really hard. That's what kids don't understand these days. Like, 
how to adjust to the new system or the new expectation as a team, right? You, you want to teach your boys or your own kids or my own kids, like you need to be this way because yes, you can do this, but you, you might be want to change your style of playing and you'll be playing more ice time, but that way you won't play less ice time. So I did adjust and unfortunately, like I made the move and I know a lot of friends like way better occupied than me and they didn't make it because they didn't adjust. You have to adjust. Right. Yeah. Be, Be open minded. Open minded. Right. Yeah. yeah. Adaptability is one thing that I talk with my clients about now a lot too, because uh and the interesting thing too about that is, and, and I've said it on this podcast before, is that that's where the passion for the game comes in. Because sometimes sometimes players only have a passion to play the game the way they want to play it right? Which yeah. means maybe scoring goals and playing the power play and not back checking. You know, I don't want to go into that puck and get that, get in that corner and get that puck or take that cross check, right? Like that's no. not fun for me. But, um, but to get to that level and to keep leveling up, sometimes we have to do things that we typically wouldn't want to do, right? And, and I think that's a passion thing, right? Are you willing to do it? To, to, yeah. to wear that jersey and collect that check and all of the amazing things that do come with whatever level that you're playing at. But when you got traded to... Um, to Calgary, how was like? When did that trade happen, and and how did that impact you and and your career? Well, it was a it there was a word weirdest like phone call I got ever in my NHL career. I got a phone call from Pierre Lacroix, my the GM, and Pierre Lacroix used to be my agent. So I got so Pierre Lacroix called me and said, "Rene, uh, come to my office." I have bad news, but it's going to be good for you. I'm like, okay. So I, I, right there, I know I get traded. I'm like, it's going to be good for you. So I'm going to his office, like, and Rene, I knew you since you're 16 years old. So I was 25 years old, 26 years old. And Pierre Lacroix, family, I know he, he, knows, he, took, me, he took, took care of me when I was 16 years old. So I knew Pierre Lacroix since 16 years old. Now I'm 23 years old, and he's trading me. He's like, come in my office, come in his office. Like, he's crying. I'm crying. He's like, sorry, but I just traded you. You got to go to Calgary tonight. Like, Great. Like, <laughs> it's like 11 o'clock in the morning. It's like that that fast. I'm like, yeah. So, who's, what's the trade? Well, we traded you and Robin Regeer for Taron Fleury and Chris Demon. I'm like, okay. So, do I have to leave tonight, or I can give me a date? No, they want you to be there tonight. I'm like, Sounds good. I'm like, I guess I'm going home now, pack everything and figure it out. The, anyway, so it was great. I, I got traded. And you know what? It was a great thing for me to go to Calgary. Uh, it gave me a chance to experience like uh, who I was as a player because the expectation was like, well, we have this kid coming at 26 years old. He scores so many goals in the queue in AHL. He's coming in now. We're going to get a ton of ice time. So one of be one of our guys will be like power play and score a goal for us in Calgary. So I was very excited. I'm like, hey, I want to play more. I will play 12 minutes a game. I'll play maybe 18 minutes a game, right? right? So it was great. I went there. I got there and they tried to compare me to, well, you got to fill the shoes of Terran Flores. Now I won't fill the shoes because T.O. is T.O. Anyway, so I came to Calgary and it was great. It was a good opportunity for me to prove myself and to be a guy, maybe more opportunities to score some goals. And so you did get some more opportunities. You, you played up in the lineup there a little bit. Oh, hundred percent. I was like in the power play. I mean, like I was playing with Higgy out of a sound play with all those guys, like, you know, and lots of chances, but I was still who I was from Colorado. Right. But you know what? I did, I did pretty good here. I was there for a year and a half. And they traded me again in the right. playoff. Uh, Unfortunately, I was in Calgary, and I'm still in Calgary now. Believe it or not, yeah. uh, it's great. That's interesting. So you, I, I'll just pick apart one the thing you said there. So you said you were still the player you were in Colorado. So you were given a different opportunity, uh, but yeah. you were you had kind of now. I don't know. You morphed yourself. Like you couldn't get back to the to the 79 goal guy. Like you you were having a hard time f finding finding that place again. Well, uh, yes. Because you know what, when they, they traded me here, they put, they put so much pressure in, in Calgary. It's like, you're going to score a bunch of goals. I'm, no, I'm not. I'm like one of those guys. I'm in Colorado. That's what you're getting. But yes, I, I did score some goals in, in Calgary as well. But it was just the fact that uh, uh, I feel like the expectations were very high compared what I was in Colorado. Right. You, you brought, I'm here. 
but don't expect for me to fill the net again. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it was just, but I think they didn't understand, but they were hoping that thing was going to happen, but no. Yeah. <laughs> it was. Expectations are hard. I mean, that was one thing that I felt, you know, when I got, I don't know if you know, if you know, like I got traded to Toronto for Kirk Muller. So it was, it was my rookie year. I was having in, in the AHL, right? Rookie year as a yeah. pro and uh, having a good year in the A over a point a game, you know, similar to you and had and had my cup of coffee up in the NHL. And then I got traded at the deadline for Kirk Muller, um, one for one to Toronto Maple Leafs. And so like showing up there, leaving the AHL, right? And Expectation. Like, oh yeah, assistant captain and the storied career he had, the second overall pick and you know, I mean, all this kind of stuff, right? It was a... Uh, it was a big deal, and and it's hard sometimes as a, especially as a young man, right? I mean, like you're, you're trying to be a hockey player, and then you're also dealing with these other, you know, expectations, ideas. You obviously want to do well yourself as an athlete too, and it's uh, yeah. it can be it can be a lot. Um, let's talk about Mario, because I mean, I, I mean, you mentioned those locker rooms, man. Like, I can't believe who you had the opportunity to play with. How special is that? And you, well, you get I'm to play. I'm very fortunate and lucky. I'm very yeah, lucky. so cool. Like Jagger and and Lemieux in that locker room. Like how. Just tell me how good they both were, and please don't hold anything well, back. No, so I'll I'll, I'll I'll say a story right now. So basically, my when I got through to Pittsburgh, it was in March, but Mario then came back in the next year in December. So, and I got through to Pittsburgh, and they give me a stall, obviously. So I'm in a stall here, and beside me, the next stall, it says 66 Mario Lemieux, but it's empty. So the next stall beside me, it's empty. So the old March playoff, there's nobody beside me. Next year, we start again, September, October, November, nothing beside me. And early December, the trainer is like, Renee, make sure, can you put your stuff, don't put any stuff there. Mario's coming back in December. He's back. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, don't put your tape and your stuff on the stall because he's coming back. It's this place. Okay. So December 26, I think, Christmas time, Mario comes back and he's right beside me in the locker room. So I remember, so I'm going to tell you a story and I'm French and English, but we're like this and Mario is like always like, Ronnie, please don't move the tape. So I give my tape and he, he stuck tape. He just, so I get up, I go to the table, there's a bunch of tape in the table, so I get more tape. So I came back, give me some tape, give some tape again. And he, about a week from now, he sit beside me. He's like, in French, he's like, hey, Rene, he's like, stop it. You can ask me for the tape back. It's okay. <laughs> Don't have to get up to get your own tape. <laughs> We're teammates. It's Mario Lemieux. I'm like, this is a legend. I'm like, I'm not going to ask him for the tape back. But he's like, ask me for the tape back, please. <laughs> Perfect. So, <I'm> like, <laughs> so, you know, it's amazing. But Mario was such. Like when he came back, the old locker room, locker room was like, wow, everybody feels so much better. It was like all the game went up and the level of uh, leadership and personality, I everything mean, my brain to the lo locker room was amazing. So did you, well, just tell the listeners here, I mean, for some, maybe there's some younger players that don't recognize when you're saying he came back, he came back from, from what to tell, tell that whole scenario. Well, I think, well, I want to show him right. I think Mario quit because he had, he had battled some cancer and he was part of the owner of the, the team. And he came back uh, because he was still young and wanted to come back and to do it again because he loves the games and so much passion is about the game. And he came back and after all the issue and adversity he dealt with, the cancer and everything, he came back and I think his first, I remember his first game, the 26th of December, he scored. For, well, against the Leaf, he scored the first goal. Boom! That was amazing. Yeah. yeah, what a what a how. So in practice, what was he um, like? What was he? What was he like as a player? I mean, uh, again, I loved. I just loved him for the fact of. To me, he was so skilled and just one on one, he was just a beast. Like for defensemen and for goalies too. And obviously, he made those around him better. But I just love the fact that he was so he was so great one on one, whether it was on a defenseman or on a or on a goaltender. But what what did what did you see with him? Like what made him special in your opinion? Uh, what's maybe special about him? Like what I didn't realize because they keep it really very quietly. But before he came back. Three, four, six months before he came back December, 
the work you put into it, with his physio, with his uh, doctor, with everyone around him, how much he worked hard to come back, it was amazing. Like, we don't realize that, you know, well, like, I have three boys in hockey right now. One play for the Calgary Canucks and, and AJHL and a great organization. Uh, they they want to develop those young boys in, in the Canucks. And we don't realize the work you have to do to get there and to come back. It's amazing. And, you know, you, Jason, you're probably there as well, you know, come back from injury or everything, the work you have to put in. And that's why you try to explain to those boys, it's not easy. You have to do these things to get back on top. Yeah. You know, it, it doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, well, that's interesting you say that because Mario, of, of all of all the stars, it, it looks so easy to him. I mean, to me, I mean, obviously he had talent that was through the roof, you know, but even even like the guys with the talent, they they still are grinders, right? They're still grinders and they're still trying yep. to get better. And guys like Crosby and, you know, he comes to mind too. Like uh, the amount of work ethic these guys put in is 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 crazy. Um, and sometimes we forget that, right? Like as as the common fan, we just think, well, they're just that much better than everybody else. Well, you know what? Majority of the time, they work that much harder than everybody else, too. Hundred percent. Like where last time I was talking with uh, Adam Demorsh, you talked about this earlier. We we're talking about this, like uh, when I play when we play in Colorado with Joe Sakic on game day, Joe Sakic would squat like two hundred twenty five pounds, squat ten times just for fun on game day. Like to get his legs going. I'm like, really? Like, who does that? We never <laughs> done that. Like, he was squatting, boom, boom, before the like lots of squat and jumping. Like, really? Like, don't hurt yourself. We need you to score goals. Today. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's all you. That's what it is. People, these guys, all the best athletes, they the work they put into it, and we all did it. It's amazing. What about Yags? Because Yags, Yags oh. has a has a, like. Uh, I mean. He's almost got legendary status when it comes to like the level of craziness that he puts in and like the times he shows up at the rink at two in the morning and every trainer yeah. has given him his own key. Like, did you see that? Like, is that all true? 100%. Like, I, like we used to come, well, we used to play a game and after the game, by the time like I, I like stretch and do a little massage or ride the bike, yeah, he's still in the gym pushing weights, like leg press. The legs this guy's got is so big compared to my. It, he works hard so much; it's unbelievable. They spend so much time on the, on the body, and because they're the best, they are the best. All the best guy Jagger, Lemieux, Sackett, they're the best. Forsberg because they work at it. You don't get that. Yes, they have the the talent, most talent in the world, but they still work on their body and physically training every day. It's He's no pain, beast, no man. gain. He was a yeah. beast. Just oh. yeah, just an animal. You know what? I, on, on that team too, there's another name that my gosh, um, I, I've heard guys say that I've interviewed here that he was the most skilled player that they ever played with, and that was Alexei Kovalev. Did you yes. did, did you see that from him too? Like was he was he ne next level when it came to that? Alexei Kovalev, yeah. I played with him in Pittsburgh. Uh Alexei Kovalev was I would say was the most natural talent. Uh, compared to Jager and Lemieux and Sackett, like these guys like do extra all the time. They lift the weights. Alexi, just natural. Alexi Kovalev, uh, well, I remember in Pittsburgh, he said, Rene, let's go to, uh, let's go to a client city. I'm like, why? Well, I got my license. I can fly planes. How do yeah, I just got my license. Just a natural guy. He's got, he's, he can fly, fly planes. He can play tennis. He can play hockey, but he doesn't work work hard. It's, I just think of it just natural skill. The way right. he plays, you can tell so much skills, and it's an amazing human being because this is actually just natural. Right. I never seen him in the gym ever. Right, right, right. And there's the other end of the spectrum, right? And there's only a select few that could be like that. I mean, that could be that yeah. naturally gifted and not really actually work at. It. And I've heard that from other guys too. That if he if he did, I mean, you, you're just assuming, right? But if he did have the work ethic of a Crosby or a Jagger, like the things that he could have done with, with the game would have been would have been scary. Well, like also like, who can fire a plane? He can fire a plane. Uh, like, it's amazing. <laughs> He's just a natural guy. Very smart yeah. guy, I guess. Eh? It's like everything yeah. is easy for him. Yeah, right. Um, so 
when you, when you left when you left the NHL, um, I don't want to keep you too long. We've already talked for for uh, seventy five minutes here, but like you know, you didn't have like once you made that trip to the NHL, you never did go back to the AHL. You know, you never you never you never you never dropped down. But then you ended up going to Germany. Was was there no contract there at the end of the day? Like what was with the the the, the hop overseas? Well, uh, what really what really made me my my decision to make it was like uh i was a free agent after pittsburgh i hear and i went to washington as a tryout and they offered me a two-week contract and uh what happened was not it was in 9 11 that was the year that happened and i was like you know what and i i just got engaged with lindsay uh and i was in calgary so i was like you know what just gonna engage so like do this, play this game. And I was on this great opportunity. I said, you got to go to my name. We'll give you a one-year deal. Just said, sure, I'll take that. And you know what? And my agent told me, give me advice. You know what? If you make that choice, do it and don't come back. Because you know what? You can play there for eight, ten years. You have lots of fun there. You make good money. You play still hockey you love. It's a good league. So sure. And that's what I decided to do because I don't want to go back and grind it out again. I grind a lot, and, and it was a great decision. And you know what? Family first, and that's why I made that call. Well, yeah, and you got to go back and then kind of be the guy again, right? You know, I mean, you were you were obviously the guy in Mannheim. You scored a ton of goals there. You got to win a championship. You know, like uh, I don't know, yep. there's something to be said for that too, right? You know, like to well, you yeah. know what? And those years in Mannheim, like this is one of the best time I've ever I had to play hockey. It was awesome. Those eight years I played there. Won a championship, won a pole call tournament, went to spend the cup. Uh, we had a chance to play together there. And man, it was a great time. Pots, like we have, uh, I remember you and Nick Nomenko team came to fir- together that year. Nick Nomenko, Nick was just telling me, like, oh, this is awesome. I said, Nick, we're in Germany now, you know, uh, make sure you're like, Okay, Cabernet Fest. Yeah, yeah, it's all Tuesday. We have day off on Tuesday night. I was like, but it was a great time. You know, yeah. we had a great time there. You, Steve Kelly, we play with, and uh, I don't I try to remember who else, but it was awesome. Yeah, well, we had um, who did we? I mean, well, we had like that was the year of the lockout. So that was when Yosh and Hesh came, right? And Cristobal Huey came that year. And um, I mean, that we had a really, really good team that you ended up losing in the final, unfortunately, to, to Berlin, yeah. but uh. But yeah, I mean that was kind of the same thing with who's, me. Who's like, the, oh, who's that guy from Boston? Uh, oh my god, Eric Healy. Yeah, Eric was there too. No, Eric was there, too, no? Eric yeah, was there heels, right? Yeah, 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 Eric, yeah. I still his kid's a real good player. Hey, um, oh, no. he went sixth overall in the uh, USHL draft. He's oh, uh, nice. yeah, he's world like kind of probably world junior stream uh, kind of guy. So I, I've been actually talking with Eric. I had him on. I had an interview with him and his son Ryan in my in my Facebook group. So I've been kept keeping touch with That's him a awesome. little bit. Yeah, it's awesome. That, Super you cool. know, it's just this is the best thing. This is awesome. Yeah, gotcha. That's the best part of it. And that's the one thing for everyone listening, like any hockey players out there, is like the relationships is the best part. You know, you get to play this game, which of course we all love, but um the guys in the locker room and like don't take that for granted because that's something that you're gonna carry carry with you for the rest of your life. And it's something that doesn't really happen that often, you know, outside of outside of hockey, you know, I mean, to, to build those relationships and work, it's, it's not quite the same. So I really enjoyed my time in Mannheim too. It was nice not to worry about getting traded. It was nice to know the days you had a game, you know, it was nice to know that your apartment was going to be the same apartment at the end of the year as it was at the start of the year. And, um, you, you, and you had the best captain there. You have the best captain you ever have. Who's the captain? <laughs> oh, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had some good times, man. That was totally fun. Um, and I think you gave me some good advice here that first year too. When uh, I, I when I first got there, I was scoring a ton of goals and like again, like felt like you know got back to what I felt that I was as a hockey player. And then Matt Mannheim gave me a contract extension there, like I think a month or two months in, and I didn't know what to do because I that wasn't really my plan. It was my plan was to go back and you know, try and try and do the NHL thing. And you're like, Hey, sign it, sign it while it's there. You and edgy. I remember saying, you know, uh, get it done. Yeah. And, uh, I ended up doing it. And I mean, and I ended up blowing my shoulder out. Like, I think it was like a month later. I that, you know? yeah. And, yeah. And that was, so it was kind of fortunate that I did do that and, and had my three years there, man, which was great, but good times, man. Uh, that's a good league too. I, I think you might never got to experience any, any other, uh, pro leagues over there league. in Europe, but, yeah. uh, 
what what have you heard about like where where the where the DAL would sit uh, compared to some of these other leagues in uh, in Europe? Well, I think it, it, it's been really it's been pretty good actually since back in the days when we played. But I think our last few years there, like it, it's really hard to make the DAL. Like they to be like you can look you can I would say you probably be at least play the AHL. To go there and play in the DL, like you can look him out like a junior player, like like it's just good hockey. Yeah, I yeah. mean, but I think the DL has improved a lot, and the, the German national team is improving a lot. It's been a lot better, I think, over the years, right? I yeah. Think. Well, I think that was the biggest. That was the biggest thing. I mean, anyone, any, any, um, what do you call when you br- use import? Uh, or? Yeah, any import that was there es- essentially had NHL experience. Almost everyone did, right? Yeah, like, you have uh, to. Yeah. yeah, you'd played some games, so the the imports were were strong. Um, yeah, and the weakness of the league was actually probably the German players, if we we're going to be honest, right? Uh, because you had to have so many Germans on the team, and that was where that was where the difference maker was. And and you're right with the with the uh, national program of Germany, like they're really improving that. So I imagine the oh. depth of the league is improved with the German players. So exactly, you're still going to get yes. the same quality of import. Yeah. So I imagine also, it's a better league now. I, I do believe the DL right now is it's, it's a lot better league than when we played back in the days, I think. I think yeah. the German, German background now, the German players now, the depth is a lot better. I think those yeah. young guys, the program they did there, it's improving. It's good. It's getting a lot better for yeah. sure. Yeah, and I definitely recommend that to players. You know, there's a lot of places to play. I know everyone, everyone who's probably a teenager right now has their eyes set on the NHL and wanting to do that. And of course, I would never tell anyone not to chase that dream. But there's so many other places to play that I didn't even realize. You know, that they'll pay you to play, and that experience of being overseas for me, and you know, seeing the German culture and being able to f- drive to. Paris in one day and you know like all the, all the exposure that we got there to uh to just this world that we have it was an awesome way to do it and experience it through the professional hockey lens so I'm super grateful for my time in, in Germany I, yeah and I encourage other guys to get out of there if they can too but Corbs I think that was great you're an amazing guest thanks so much for doing this and um you know I Funny. gotta check that the French box right <laughs> yeah check check the French guy is over now <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's great. You know what? And uh, uh, like, I'm glad. I'm happy. And I'm, I'm so happy you did this. And like, now we can touch base. And maybe I'll be back here. I'll be back in July and we can go play golf. Yeah, you can beat me at golf this summer. I'll let you beat me as long as you buy me the beer after. And we'll be all good. Sounds good. We'll send your family and good to talk to you, Jason. Yeah, definitely. So I had to Lindsay too. And uh, yeah, we'll touch base <laughs> off- offline for sure. And we'll talk about your boys because I didn't get into that as much. But uh, thanks so much, Rene Corbet, everybody, uh, for episode 58. Uh, Till next time. Cheers. Thank you so much for being here for episode 58 with Rene Corbet. Uh, Rene has, has quite the story. And I think the, the one thing you, you heard him say here again and again and again was, uh, you know, that about the adaptability component of being able to do what the team wants and what the coach wants, uh, especially at the NHL level. If you want to make that next team, it might not be on your terms, right? You may have to shift. You may have to develop components of your game that you might otherwise not have uh, in order to get your foot in the door and then also in order to stay there. Uh, Rene is very proud of his 362 games and Stanley Cup, and he should be. Um, he fought hard for every single one of those games. I, I can totally relate. Um, you know, in the 41 that I played, you know, it's it's a hard it's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to make it, and it's even harder to stay. And for Renee to play the, uh, you know, geez, what is it, five seasons, six full seasons in the NHL, um, geez, uh, really respect what he was able to accomplish. Uh, I respect what the career he was able to develop in, in the DEL too, and what he did for the Mannheim Eagles, and it was uh, it was an honor to be a teammate with him. So uh, remember, young players out there, right? Adaptability, coachability is a great thing, and start working on those components of the game. You know, here's a guy that scored 79 goals in Major Junior. You know, he led his team in the AHL. This this is rarefied air. You know, to be able to accomplish those types of things. Yet at the NHL level. He was never a goal scorer. Like, you have to understand how hard it is to be a goal scorer at the NHL level. I'm not saying you can't do that. Of course I don't. I always believe in dreams. But we have to understand that we need to round out aspects of our game. Become a 200-foot player. 
understand what it is to play defense, how to kill penalties, how to take a hit, how to give a hit, how to play with energy. Um, these are all things that are going to help you because as you level up, it gets harder and harder and harder. And if something is hockey, is something you want to take uh, seriously and as a career, um, I suggest the adaptability piece um, and the evolution piece of you as a player and, and trying to be as well-rounded as you can is a, is a great lesson to take from Renee. So until next time, play hard. Keep your head up.